All right, welcome everybody to a new show, a new beginning of a new series uh, we're doing here on, uh, well, we're doing it live on YouTube right now. It'll be broadcast over on uh, Gun Streamer once it's done. I'm here with Logan uh, from High Caliber History. Welcome. Hi there. And uh, we were chatting uh, off air, I guess, uh, recently and talking about museums and started, thought it would be a good idea to do um, a series on the various gun museums here in the United States. Yeah, and boy, there are a lot of them. <laughs> there are, and um, well, I guess, where do we start this whole thing? I guess we figured let's just jump in and start somewhere, and I guess uh, I was going to, I showed you a link, if I can find it now, I'm screen sharing, I showed you a link uh, that I have on gunshopguide.com, which is where I um, feature the gun shops that I visited on the various tours and things, and that's where I keep the museums that I visited, and I've yeah. got scrolling there, but then I mentioned... Uh, ben Nicholson, who I found when I was looking for gun show or for firearms museums out there, he's got this excellent, excellent website. And I was chatting with you a bit offline, so why don't we start there? Um, you yeah. know, you know Ben. Yeah, I know Ben. Um, and it's interesting that that Ben put together a resource like this uh, because, uh, as you and I had talked on uh, off the air, Ben's British uh, and he teaches at the Art Institute of Chicago. So, you know, that's a, a couple things that you, you don't necessarily immediately associate uh, with being into firearms. Um, but Ben is uh, one of those anomalies, one of those good anomalies. And, and he has put together this awesome list of 32 different firearms museums or rather museums that have significant firearm displays in them. Uh, and he even goes so far as to listing, you know, how many pieces are in the collection and then how many of those uh, are, are on display, uh, which is good information to have as well. Um, and he's, he's done a, a remarkable job with putting all of it together. And there's some stuff on there, you know, places you might not think of. You know, the Met has an amazing firearms collection, but you don't necessarily think of the Met uh, as having firearms um, and it's, it's, uh, just a, a great list of, of places that he's put together. I think he's got 32 of them on here. And then, uh, between that and your list, which, which has uh, a lot of stuff on there that his doesn't have, um, there's, you know, we, you could go on and on and on for quite some time, uh, dealing with these places, uh, and, and never run out of, uh, of places to visit. So it's, uh. It's a good it resource of, to have. Kind of depends on scale, right? Because I've been to some like BFW halls. I mean, the, the Cody Firearms Experience, which I think you would just call like a gun shop or maybe even a shooting range. It's a gun shop shooting range and uh, kind right. of experience, they call it. They have a, a wall up that's it's museum quality and it's neat and it's yep. acceptable and uh, stuff like that. You know, again, depending on scale, some of that I would include as museum type stuff, especially when it's in a part of the country that's maybe vacant. Um, right. But you can see from Ben's uh, map here, which I think is a neat way of um, using the internet uh, to visually keep, you know, a, kind of a track of where these things are and kind of see where they are. Um, yeah, absolutely. So and I guess how, can ahead. we start to divide them up? Like, what types of firearms museums are there? I mean, we know there's a lot of them. I mean, we could go regionally, we could go by era, but I think there's probably other ways we could divide them up. Yeah, there's like you said. Yeah, we could we could probably go by you know dedicated firearms museums. We could go by art museums that happen to have firearms. Um, you know, regions. Obviously, you know, looking at the at the map that Ben's got, there's a lot uh, up in the northeast area. Um, just by nature of what happened to be uh, the Valley of Gun Making, you know, the the breadbasket of gun making up in the Connecticut Valley. Um, and then, of course, you get some stuff in the Midwest and out west, like uh, the the Cody Firearms Museum and stuff. Um, yeah, we we could we could go in a, a variety of of different ways. Um, gosh, let's see. Looking at the, like you mentioned, the art museums. I mean, that, that's intriguing to me. We were talking a bit about the Chicago Art Museum. The guy that Ben Nicholson that made this map that we're looking at is from the Chicago right. Art Museum. You mentioned the Metropolitan Museum of Art in what, New York, I guess? Which, yes. Uh -huh. um, and then the Smithsonian, which is a lot more than just an art museum. But those are what I would call big museums that have other things than 
I would call, say even a substantial amount of guns, or at least significant, right, guns. But then right. there's military museums, like the the 45th Infantry Museum here in Oklahoma City, 45th Infantry Division Museum. Um, mm -hmm. You've got Aberdeen. Uh, I haven't been to those. Quantico. I imagine those are pretty awesome. There's probably yeah. something in Florida for the Navy, I bet, or for SEALs. Uh, yep. And then, and then have, like, bring backs and stuff. But then you get Civil War battlefields, which aren't really military anymore. They're more like Park Service, probably. Right. It, yeah, most of it's National Park Service. Yep. Um, but that's, you know, and then that's the interesting thing is that you get places like Springfield Armory and Harper's Ferry Armory uh, are both Park Service. But that is, you know, they are absolutely gun centric and, and gun central because of what they are. Um, and again, you know, more regional stuff. You got the, the museum at Rock Island Arsenal, um, uh, which is a, a cool place, too. It's not open a whole lot. Um, they're trying to get it open a little more frequently, um, but basically everything they have is on display. I mean, and it is literally just walls and walls and walls of guns. Um, and they've got some, some neat historically significant pieces there, you know, like they've got, um, they've got the, uh, the Rock Island made M1903 serial number one there uh they have the, the springfield armory m1 grand serial number two uh on display there um they've got stuff that they have uh, forensically proven was uh, with custer's men at the battle of little bighorn um it just just some really really neat stuff there um and of course uh, you know talking about uh, serial number two grand of course serial number one is at Springfield Armory um, up in Massachusetts. That's a, a great facility there as well. Um, and then Harper's Ferry to a, to a lesser extent, um, you know, obviously it was the smaller of the two arsenals, um, but they've got some, some neat historically significant pieces there. And it's a night and day difference between Springfield and Harper's Ferry because uh, everything at Harper's Ferry burned in 1861. It was part of with the Civil War breaking out. And so that's, uh, that's an institution that um, functionally has been defunct for more than 150 years, whereas Springfield Armory was a, a functioning military arsenal into the 1960s. Um, so it's, it's two totally different uh, concepts that are, are being displayed and interpreted, and yet they're both National Park Service sites. So it's kind of cool to see those two differences. No, I don't know. Does he have Harper's Ferry on here? I don't, I don't see it. I mean, no, I didn't see it. So then, are they near each other physically? Where's Harper's Ferry? No, at? not at all. Harper's Ferry <laughs> is in present-day West Virginia. Oh, I'm in nowhere near. Okay, so then um, <laughs> uh, Springfield Armory, when they, I guess, would you call it decommission the factory? Was right. There, was there any, like, um, thought put to maintaining it as a uh, historic stuff? Well, they had um, they had a historic collection to begin with. They've always had some form of a museum there. Um, even going back into the 1800s, there's neat old photos and stuff of uh, of what their museum used to look like. And uh, so they they kind of had it uh, all set up for that, and it was just a, a relatively easy transition, uh, I guess. You know, to go from from it being uh, a federal facility as an arms manufacturer to being a federal facility uh, welcoming visitors and, and showing off their museum collections. Um, so I'm trying to see. Did it start right away in the 60s when it was decommissioned then? is a, Did it go right away full time into a museum or archive? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure how immediately it switched over. Um, and then we've got like um, the factories themselves, Colt, Springfield, well, not Springfield, but Colt and um, I can't think of some other com country uh, companies. Um, well, Smith & Wesson had had a, an on-site place for a long time. Winchester. Um, at Winchester, yeah. And of course, that all got absorbed uh, by the Cody Museum. Um, now, but, and that's uh, where like Winchester, when it started to disassemble or get purchased they had the museum that Winchester had always had a type room right like he kept one the right. ones or something and that was more like a sales slash just a cool room to have in your 
rifle factory, I guess, right? And right. so they had all these guns, and once it was no longer going to be a company, they realized the value, and I think they just gave them to the Cody Museum. You know, that, and again, that's, that's something I'm not entirely certain how they ended up with all of them. Um, I, I know at one they point. They went in mass to Wyoming. Like they they kept them together and they're in they went to Wyoming as a collection. Right. Yes. Yeah. It was a it was a concerted effort to to put them there. They didn't end up there, you know, uh, by by accident or anything like that. Um, but here I'm going to do a, a quick screen share with the. Uh, is that showing up now? With the, yep. the Springfield Armory. Let's see. Uh, share. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So here's some some early images. Uh, this is on the Park Service website, but you can see, you know, they've got the sabers and stuff hanging from the ceilings there, and um, a couple well dressed individuals walking through there, and um, postcard from the early 1900s with the, the Billinghurst Requa uh, gun there, which is a, a really neat piece. Um, and then you've got tons of Civil War muskets and stuff. Uh, this particular setup was used at the 1876 Centennial Exposition. Um, and, now, and then pictures, are those each separate individual? Are they separate or is that just to show the quantity of guns they could do with uh, interchangeable parts? Like are those all the same gun or are those like specimens? Uh, I imagine those are all pretty much the same. Um, they've, they've got just an insane amount of, of firearms uh, on display there, they've got their, uh, their, uh, they call it their organ, their, uh, um, they've got a, a Civil War organ-ish is what they call it, of firearms, um, trying to talk and type, <laughs> uh, and it's a, it's just a, a massive, uh, display, yeah, the organ of muskets, they call it. So it looks like uh, organ pipes or something, but it's a bunch of different muskets in on display. Right. I'm trying to see if they have a good view of it. Ah, uh, here we go. That should, as long as I can get this page to load, uh, makes for an impressive display. All right, I'll do the screen share here. Um, there, is that showing up? Yep. Yeah. So it they call it their organ of muskets, and that's uh, every single gun there is a Springfield Model 1861 rifled musket. Um, so it is uh, just a massive, massive amount uh, of of guns, all of the exact same type. Those are all the exact same type gun. And it just it goes all the way around, and it doesn't uh, doesn't even begin to to scratch the tip of the iceberg there with their collection uh, and of course it it spans the gamut from the the very earliest pieces that they were making there you know the the uh, the pattern 1795 muskets uh, you know all the way up through uh, what they were producing uh, when it closed down in the 1960s so and that display was that for one like the world's fair or something i don't think so i think that was just a, a really cool um Let's show off our really cool stuff. <laughs> right well, is one way to, I mean, again, trying to think about how to, to get a grasp on these things and get a, take a bite of them, is a way to start the largest, start with what the largest one is? What would you think yeah. the largest museum is? Uh, I think uh, largest, well, it, in terms of number of guns in the collection, I believe uh, is the J.M. Davis Museum. Oh, really? I was going to think Smithsonian. So you've seen the both. Is that you're saying the J.M. Davis bigger? Yeah, uh, the J.M. Davis Museum uh, is is definitely bigger. Um, Davis, I think, has about twenty thousand firearms in their collection. Um, it is a, an absolute staggering number. Um, and it's it, it dwarfs so many uh, so many other museums out there, um, including the Smithsonian. Smithsonian's got some awesome stuff, um, but it is 
definitely not the biggest. Uh, and there's certainly far fewer of them on display uh, yeah. than there would be uh, anywhere else. Most of the Smithsonian stuff is is locked away in storage and, and we'll never see the light of day. Um, and part of that's just because, uh, because oh. of the nature of what it is uh, and where it is. <laughs> and the public opinion right now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Smithsonian is an interesting one. So yeah, according to Ben's site, which has, like we mentioned, uh, it has some ratios. So it, according to this one, the uh, Smithsonian has 7,000 guns with only 150 on display. That's 2% of their total inventory on display. They've been around since 1876. If we go back to J.M. Davis, they say 13,000, but I've heard the higher number as well. And they're saying 9,000 plus on display, which is more like 70% of their collection on display. So that's Interesting. Now, the Smithsonian, when I was a kid, I first went to the Smithsonian as a young and I honestly don't remember. I was a little kid and I remember going to the Smithsonian. It was whatever room, whatever building in the Smithsonian that the MASH tent was in. I'm almost positive it was in, they had the MASH, you know, uh, stuff on display. Uh huh. And they had like, I don't know, I mean, I'm a little kid and I'm exaggerating, but it seemed like an entire floor of a big building was rifles and I was amazed by just how many rifles there were there and i went back again in 2001 five guns on the wall like there was a a, a ground garand i'm gonna keep on garand uh like a a springfield mo3 uh, 1903 and then like an m16 and maybe an m60 like in this glass wall as you were going down some steps and yeah. it took me most of the day to, to verify that that is really all they had out and then i was just frustrated because <laughs> i know they exist and yeah. uh, went back again whenever we visited in what like last year, and then when I went back in twelve, I've attempted to talk to the Smithsonian. I can't get anywhere. I don't have a large enough clout. I don't know who to contact or whatever. But even to see the collection, but you're thinking that I, when I asked them in twelve, they said that it was on. It was like it was pending, like an online display or something. Like they're going to take pictures of everything. Do you think they'll even do that? Because I don't think they've done that ever. Well, I know that because uh, I used to work for the Smithsonian uh, in in one of my previous lives, and and one of their big pushes is an attempt to to digitize their collections um, and and digitize everything. And of course, you know the the Smithsonian isn't just yeah. one place. Yeah, you know it's technically nineteen museums in a zoo, um, and so it's a lot of stuff to digitize. And everything is critically uh, has something to do with this country. Like it's all super important stuff. It's it's not right. A, oh, here's a banana or something. Right, right, yeah. So there's there's a, a tremendous amount of stuff, and it's just it's going to take a long time for them to get everything online. Uh, and unfortunately, that's that's really what it's going to take for for people to be able to see the majority of what the Smithsonian has in their collection in terms of firearms, um, because it'll never all go on display, partly because of space and partly because that's just, it's just not their, uh, their focus, uh, w which is a shame because it's a great collection. Um, and, and the curator in charge of it is a very nice guy and he knows his stuff. Um, but it's just, you know, that's the nature of the beast when you're dealing with a, a government run museum, you know? Uh, so that, so we're thinking JM Davis is the biggest. Now, have you been to Dragon Man's? I have not. Uh, I, I've seen, you know, different YouTube videos and stuff and uh, see, it's hard for me to even consider that as a museum. As far as I'm concerned, that's a dude who's got a private collection that he likes to show off. Yeah. <laughs> He shares his collection 100%. I mean, it's a museum because of the stuff is so crazy rare and it's such a, you know, complete set of collection stuff. But you're right. It's like there's no, well, there actually there's nothing, but there's very few like labels or anything. Its goal isn't uh, to archive, but the experience of just being able to walk around. Oh, it's amazing. Have you been to the 45th Infantry Division Museum in Oklahoma City? No, unfortunately, I haven't. I haven't spent a whole lot of time uh, in in Oklahoma. When I'm in Oklahoma, it was generally uh, because I was going to the the Tulsa Arms Show, 
um, or the J.M. Davis Museum, stuff like that. I, I need to get get out there and spend some more time there because I, I have heard that that is a fantastic museum. It is neat. And it's a good hour something from Tulsa, which doesn't lend itself to just dropping by or anything. It's basically a day. Plus, plus you're going to want to spend some time in that museum. But it's right. uh, it's a private collection, basically, that was given or gifted. I don't know what it's called, but like given to the possession of the 45th Infantry Division to curate. And they put it in uh, displays based on um, theater. So it's neat to just see him. Uh, the, the, it's not it's a, a very large. I, I guess it, I don't think he's got it in his list to get a number of guns from it. Maybe he does. 14. No, he's got the Cowboy Museum, which is another awesome one in Oklahoma City. But uh, just the number of guns is massive, but they're so packed into the displays and then sorted by a campaign. It's just really efficient, I guess. If you really mm -hmm. just see just the guns from a, you know, the Spanish-American War, boom, they were just right there in one case. And then you can go to see the Vietnam guns, boom, right in one case. For the last nice. And then there's a lot of static displays outside. So it's a great, you know, some of these museums can be really nerdy or just maybe not that interesting to somebody who's not even into guns, or maybe even if you're into guns, you know, some of them just honestly aren't that interesting. Right. So trying to get a family or something to go would be a struggle, but something like the, the 45th Infantry Division Museum, they've got so many of these outside static displays with uh, vehicles and planes and stuff that I think any kid in the right mind is going to have fun just running around out there for a while while you're inside. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and there's a, uh, there's a comment from Ertis and Tony in here. And he's looking at Ben's website and he's confused about Ben having a thing about Brexit on there. So uh, at the beginning, we mentioned that Ben is British. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, Ben is is uh, he's he's tied up in all of that because that's that's who he is. So <laughs> uh, that's why you're going to find a, a link to stuff about Brexit at the top of Ben's Gun Museum website page. <laughs> Now, you mentioned not getting to Oklahoma City. So have you been to the Cowboy Museum there? No, uh, unfortunately, I, I haven't been to that one either. Um, it's There's a lot of places uh, that I want to get to and get back to. And um, I just unfortunately haven't had a chance to spend a whole lot of time in Oklahoma as a whole um, with, with having free time. You know, like I said generally it's because I was there. Uh, for a, a specific purpose and wasn't uh, wasn't afforded the luxury to to get around to it, but um, it's definitely one of the places I want to get back to when I have more time to spend. It's definitely cowboy themed, of course, but I consider it almost well, definitely more of an art museum with guns. And some of the art museums with guns, I don't want anybody to be discouraged because that's one of them that's super impressive, just an awesome collection. The Autry Museum, similar, right? Uh, the art museums, lots of Native uh, American art, and then. Hollywood cowboy type stuff, and then the Colt collection there is really neat. Have you been to that yes. one? Yes, yeah, they, they do. They have an an amazing collection uh, of firearms that, yeah, like you said, people might not. This way, like, oh, it's a cowboy museum, it's western, yeah, but you know, you can't have that without uh, without all the cool guns. And they do. You're right. Their Colt collection uh, is absolutely remarkable they've got some some awesome early pieces and and they've got some beautiful um absolutely artistic guns more than anything you know that that were never made to be fired certainly they function but uh they were designed to be art pieces um and so they've got a lot of that on display there um which is uh, a similar concept to what you end up seeing um when you go to um Oh gosh, what's the name of it? I'm blanking on it. Uh, like the displays at the Wadsworth Athenaeum uh, up in New England, um, or you know stuff that you're going to see at the Met. Um, you know, certainly a, a lot older at the Met, but that uh, that also lends itself to guns that are heavily engraved and inlaid with gold. You know, pieces that were designed for 17th and 18th century royalty and stuff like that. Um, so you you're definitely going to an art museum. Uh, and you're seeing art, uh, but it is art in the form of firearms. And it's there's some really impressive stuff in all of those collections there. I agree. And now it's one of those things that I think I've been guilty in the past, or not guilty, but just, you know, this is one of those things that I think as a gun owner, you either get into or you don't, or you're just aware of or not. But um, it's sort of like the front room of the NRA Museum, the National Firearms Museum, and just outside of D.C., when you 
tour that museum, it's sort of a, let's say a crescent shape, a C shape. So as you walk in, you go through that fine gun room and same kind of stuff, engraved guns. Um, is part of, I think part of the reason that guns are engraved, just like knives, is that they're made out of metal, but they were significant. Like you owned a bunch of temporary things made out of wood, and then you owned this thing made out of metal that was a gun, right? And if you were in the frontier, that allowed you to be free and independent. If you were in a city, it allowed you to go about your business. And and those were significant to people. Like you owned a family gun or something, right? Like you were a soldier, you went to where you had a gun. It, it was the same significance that we've got to our property today, right? Except that back then, that might be the most expensive thing they own. So like their car or a watch or a piece of jewelry, right? And that's right. why they find themselves to be in decorated like that. It's like you don't decorate a rock or a you know, a shoe so much as something that's going to stick around for a while has significance and meaning and worth. Yeah, absolutely. So when they see these things, guns, firearms, intricately made up, that's got to have some influence when people visit art museums, you know, because they're not going to art museums like most of us as gun people. They're going to art museums to experience the culture and, you know, the breadth of what's out there. And luckily, there's some of these museums that appreciate the guns, at least right. the art museum, right? Exactly. And that's that's what I have noticed uh, with different visitors, whether it's going through uh, the NRA Museum, which, you know, of course, I, I spent almost five years working there um, and they've got some amazing engraved stuff, like you said. And, and it really it does draw people in. You know, you you see that situation where the, the husband is dragging his wife along, uh, go to that museum uh, and he's enamored by, you know, just guns on guns on guns on guns. Um, but the, the people who have little to no interest in the firearms usually end up walking away saying that's uh, that, that's amazing. You know, there's some of the most beautiful uh, pieces of art uh, that they've ever seen because that's exactly what they are. Um, you know, I, I, I dare you to go up to a, a, an engraver and tell him he's not an artist. You know, you'll, you'll only get away with saying that once. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, everything, I mean, jewelry, watches, so many things are, we appreciate the intricacies of them. So Exactly. Yeah, I, you know, and, and a lot of it overlaps. Uh, for example, there's, there's a, a gentleman who lives not too far from me. Uh, he's, uh, over the last number of years, he has turned his focus uh, to completely to engraving guns because that's his passion. But he spent uh, more than 20 years as the chief engraver for Tiffany's up in New York. Um, and so, you know, talk about someone who really, really knows his stuff um, and, and spent a long time engraving bracelets and charms and, and things of that nature. Uh, and now he is taking Tiffany quality engraving, you know, and, and adapting it to, to firearms. And so that's, it, you know, I challenge you to say that's not art. <laughs> um, well, we have a question from Clover out there asked if you've seen the Texas Ranger Museum in Waco. No, unfortunately, I have not. Um, I've got some connections there, and I got to get out there. Uh, I've heard it's a, a really cool place. Um, yeah, I think. Clover, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Clover, have you been? Because because uh, I I have not, and it's it's definitely on the list. It, you know, it's funny we keep bringing this up. I'm like, have you been there? No. Have you been there? No. I promise, I've been to quite a few, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> all of these, and I have not gotten to too many of those. So the. Waco is just about here on my map, and Clover's over here. So it's not a top skip and a jump for him, but it's closer than any rest of us. Um, gotcha. But Waco is a cool place. I, I stopped there because I'm, you know, Long Ranger. Come on, Texas Ranger Museum. But I was amazed. Sure. It's really a good gun museum. Like they devote a good 25% of their space to just info about guns. It's really interactive. They got a walker there that kids can fiddle with, see the weight of it. They've nice. got. Um, Patterson that you can take apart into the five pieces. They're all tethered there so a kid can see the five pieces kind of do a um, What is it the good bad the ugly, you know, or whatever it is just pull it out right. But very uh, cool neat and then they've got real guns So they've got like crime guns and and stuff, uh, you know, the guns of the Rangers themselves and then they got a whole like uh, kind of memorial to some of the Rangers and their and their their, their sidearms Really That's really fantastic. cool. Lots of honor in that building. Yeah, lots of Let's respect that one. And you can go check out the Dr. Pepper Museum, which is kind of neat, too. Hey, there you go. <laughs> um, so um, maybe another way is, is there a most uh, 
um, like I was going to say a couple of them. Like, is there a most the most critical museum or like the most um, interesting or the what was the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, the, the the one that's the most authentic or like if you have to see if you can see one museum and you're truly into guns, I think I know which one I'm going to pick. But now I'm kind of skeptical on which which two I, I want to pick. But uh, is there one that's like the most? Uh, you know, that's. And that's kind of that's kind of tough because there's there's so many great ones um, and in so many different locations. You know, I would almost say we'd we'd have to break it down by by location. You know, if if you're up in the New England states, uh, you definitely got to get to Springfield Armory and check that out because it is just a remarkable collection. Um, you know, if you're if you're more in the the mid Atlantic, you know, maybe a little biased, but definitely check out the the National Firearms Museum there. Um, yeah, the right, which is amazing. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, so if you're in the mid Atlantic, that's that's a a, a great choice. Um, if you find yourself in the Midwest area, um, you, you know, you've got the Rock Island Arsenal Museum, which is fantastic. Um, the uh, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on it. I had it. <laughs> um, Illinois. Anyway, but I'm sorry. We're thinking of one in Illinois. Uh, well, the the Rock Island ones there in Illinois. Um, of course, if you're in in Chicago, you go to the AIC. Um, a little disappointing if you're in the, the Midwest, one that uh, used to be a great one to go see was the Milwaukee Public Museum Library with the Nunnemacher collection. Uh, and unfortunately they have taken almost all of those guns off of display, um, which is uh, kind of sad. Um, oh, another one, if you're in the Mid-Atlantic, go to the Marine Corps Museum. That is an absolutely fantastic place. Uh, down, near, down near Quantico, yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when I went there in in twelve, Obama had done something where all the museums were closed for funding or you know to save money. All the museums were the ones that got cut, so we got uh, everything was closed. So like the the Marine Small Arms, is it Aberdeen? Well, Aberdeen's closed permanently. Um, that, we were trying to get to the Small Arms Museums because that's where like each of the branches has their own Small Arms Museum. I think Army, Navy, and Marines are all in D.C. area, right? Gotcha. Yeah, but the the National Museum of the Marine Corps is is a uh, its own separate entity. It's huge. It is uh, it is government run, um, but it is a, a much larger facility. Um, really, really impressive. It's a bummer that it was closed when when you were out this way, because um, that's that's a really really cool museum there. Um, let's see what else. These good ones, of course. You know, if you're you're further out west, definitely got to check out the J.M. Davis Museum. As we said, that's probably the largest of the ones um, with a, a collection between twelve and twenty thousand. I don't I don't know exactly how big. And you um, need like to said that you just drive into the parking lot, which is never crowded. You walk in; it's completely free. But you're a jerk if you don't leave a donation, which is completely <laughs> on your own. But you can just, you're literally walking in. They're all behind glass, but you're inches away from what, what, what 9,600 guns? All yeah, it is, it is a ton of guns. Ton of guns. You can ask um, for a tour if you have just a couple of people, ask ahead of time, and they'll be happy to arrange a tour if they don't have other things on their schedule. They've been mm -hmm. super, super nice about it. Uh, yep. and, okay, so. Um, yeah. I guess I was thinking, you know, trying to think of like the most authentic, maybe that's what I was trying to say. Like, so Nauvoo, Illinois is where John Browning's dad had a shop and it wasn't where he invented the harmonica gun, but it was, you know, one of the stages in his development as a gunsmith and you can, they right. rebuilt, the Mormons have rebuilt his, his gun shop. So you can literally stand on the footings and in the exact location that John Browning's dad stood in. That's pretty neat. Go that's in. very cool. It is, and the, there's not a lot of guns there, but just as far as like being a gun person and standing there, that's significant. Um, right. Damn, Dave, or the Browning Museums in Ogden, well, the museum in Ogden is, is neat because it's Browning, uh, but you can walk out of the building and go to his fa three factories. Two of them are still standing. Uh, you can go to his house, 
three of them are still standing. What am I saying? All three, three of the four are still standing. His house is there. His store is there. You can lay hands on his buildings. That's just, again, significant. The museum yeah. is run by people who know what they're doing. Um, and you're intimate with them. You're just right there with his guns. The thing about Browning is he didn't keep all his guns. He would develop something and take it apart and develop the next thing. So the best thing you got is his type samples that he would give to Winchester. Like, here, I'm selling you this product. This, from what I understand, I'm selling you this patent. Here's an example of it. And he would send Winchester some thing. It looked like a gun. Winchester right. would take it and put it in this collection, which is now in Cody. I have yet to see that. You've experienced that. And I can't imagine being in the room with Browning's prototypes. That's got to be something. Yeah, it's it's really uh, amazing. Now, of course, Cody is is undergoing a major multi-million dollar renovation that's going to open up here in uh, in just a couple of weeks or about a month or so. Um, but when I had gone through it previously, you know, they've completely uh, uh, replicated entire workrooms on display there. You know, and you walk into them, and you know, they they haven't been a working factory in you know decades, but you can still smell. Uh, you know, all the gun oil and the lubricants and stuff that have seeped into the workbenches and stuff. Um, and it's, it is, it's really, really impressive to, to go see that stuff and, uh, and see the different prototypes. You know, they've got uh, some of the, the Winchester handguns uh, that were uh, prototype pieces that they kind of ended up in a, a standoff with, uh, with Colt over. And it was like, all right, well, we'll quit developing the handguns if you stay out of the long guns kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's just, it's really impressive to be able to, to see how it all fit together. Um, because of course, you, you know, the, the main Winchester factory, you know, it's not like you can, go to her and see what it was like, you know, 100 and 150 years ago. Um, but you can come pretty close to replicating that stuff uh, at the Cody Museum, or at least you could uh, the last time I saw it. Um, and, and like you said, sometimes it's just about standing in that space, like with going to the Browning factory and being able to uh, to lay hands on, on his original workshop buildings and, um, same with up at Springfield Arsenal, uh, you know, to, to go and, and walk those halls and, and those buildings um, where some of the greats have been and, you know, down closer to, to where I live at Harper's Ferry, you know, that's all gone, but you can still go walk along the river there, the two rivers and, and imagine uh, what it was like when all of those huge factories and the, the water turbines were spinning and getting everything uh, squared away and hustling and bustling. Um, and it just, it's, it's really an impressive feeling. Um, you know, that if you are uh, a gun guy or a gun gal, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's our Graceland, you know, a lot of these places, uh, to, to go and see and reconnect with them. And that's, what's so great is that they're all different, um, but they're all equally fantastic in their own right. Oh, I just thought of something. Is there is one way to categorize them for someone who might be trying to think of some travel destination or some? Are any of them uh, in imminent danger? You mentioned the one in Wisconsin. It sounds like is already disam disassembled, disassembled, whatever the word would be. Um, right. Are there others that are imminently, you know, might not be there forever. Right. That's a good question. Yeah. Unfortunately, the the Milwaukee Public Museum, uh, the Nunnemacher Collection, that's. That one has gone by the wayside. When you say um, that, is that a person? Is that like one individual's collection that's on display there, or was that a type of Nunnemacher? Yeah, uh, no, it was Mr. Nunnemacher, and I can't remember his first name, but he had developed this huge collection uh, of guns, and he gave it to the the museum there, and they had the the large majority of it on display for decades and decades. Um, but then, of course, you know, things change and, and they have taken it off of display. Um, same goes for the Fraser History Museum. Um, there is not nearly as many firearms on display at the Fraser as there used to be. You know, it used to be a, a big deal. That was one of the main draws there. Um, and unfortunately, that's that's just not the case uh, anymore. Um, Where which was Louisville? What was what was that? Yeah. Like? Yep, that one was uh, the Fraser one was in Louisville. Yep. Was this a factory, or was this just a guy that had a, sh a collection? Or uh, well, the the Fraser History Museum it kind of covered uh, a little bit of everything. 
um, but they just happen to have a really remarkable firearms collection. Um, but with the way politics and things have gone, uh, the Fraser has has shifted their focus uh, away from that, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of stuff is just sitting in storage now. Well, okay, so let's address that. You got some insight, and I think we both want to encourage people to visit museums. And you know, it's not—I mean, there are a lot of museums. I'm going to go back to Ben's map here, and this is—I'm going to do something similar. Uh, I've attempted it on my site down here, but. I haven't updated it, but you can get the idea. There's museums all over, and there are more in the West. Uh, but in other words, you can sneak away to a museum if you're there for a business or family or wedding or something. Uh, but you know, being keeping these in mind, being aware of them, gives you an opportunity to go sneak away. But that admission uh, price to the museum or the you know the donation that you the voluntary donation that you leave, uh, as well as like the for a museum that has multiple things on display, letting the people know that you're there for the guns, you appreciate the guns, that's got to go a long way, right? They don't, it's just like anything, they don't, they only get so much feedback. So the percent right. of feedback we give them on keep the guns here, thank you for these guns, that's got to go, you know, it's got to yeah. be useful. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. You know, if they're noticing a visitor trend of, you know, well, there's not a lot of people in the gun gallery, you know, well, then they're going to uh, maximize the usage of that space and, and switch it out with stuff. So, yeah, you know, definitely make uh, make sure to mention, you know, to the people at the front desk and the docents and stuff, you know, mention, you know, hey, I'm here to see the firearms. I want to see the firearms collection. Uh, if they have a, uh, if they've got you know, visitor surveys and comment cards, definitely let them know what you thought of the firearms uh, on display and, you know, and good or bad, you know, It'd be like, oh, you know, hey, I heard you had a, a great collection, wish there was more of it on display or, or something along those lines too. Um, it's, it's equally beneficial because really, uh, from my experience working in the museum field, um, you know, you really do want to send your uh, your best stuff out based on visitor demand because you know let's let's face it if if people aren't interested in what you've got on display then they're not going to come visit and if they're not visiting then your uh, you know your revenue goes down and all that stuff so. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely fill out visitor surveys. They are incredibly important. I know they can kind of be uh, a pain in the behind sometimes and, and um, a little tedious, but people really do read them uh, and they try as much as possible to, to take it to heart uh, and, and do what people want based on those surveys. I know that we always read the surveys uh, working at the National Firearms Museum and, and when I worked for the Park Service and stuff. Um, definitely, visitor surveys are annoying uh, as a consumer, um, but they are absolutely vital uh, to making sure that what is on display is what you want to see. That's the whole point, right? Yeah, it's an opportunity to get to let them know, you know, more than just to thank the individual there, but like we have in some kind of an archive or record that you appreciate the guns and think about all the people that might go there and see distaste. Oh, this is violence. And they're going to leave some right. comment part about how it's horrible. And they're, you know, right. and they're going to be, they're ignoring in, in interchangeable parts. They're ignoring the revolution. They're ignoring the fact that by being an independent free country in the world, you know, we led the way, we uh, kept freedom and democracy going uh, versus, uh, you know, the, what was it, uh, colonialism. You know, there's mm. things that they want to ignore that they get to bask in based on firearms. And, of course, those who control history or whatever it is, the history books, you know, changes, whatever. So, yeah, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're doing what we can, being aware of that. And, and that, that to that end, um you know, in our activism type of chats and stuff, we'll encourage people to uh, seek out maybe organizations that they might become a member of to support them financially, even if they're not there, you know, in the same area, uh, if they're dealing with laws or something. But same thing with these firearms museums. So a $20 donation in the mail has got to be appreciated. And if it comes along with a letter that says, thank you for having a portion or you know, dedicating a portion of your resources to firearms, that's important to me. Here's $20. That's, that's yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's, you know, especially, you know, with, with most museums, you know, they're, they're 
generally under the auspices of a 501c3 nonprofit, which means they don't have a big budget. Uh, and oftentimes the, the majority of the people there are going to be volunteer docents. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really does go a long way and it means a lot. Uh, especially to the smaller museums that, you know, to know that what they're doing is interesting to people and they're appreciative of it. You know, I mean, you know, Smithsonian's going to get tens of millions of people coming through over the years um, because it's the Smithsonian, you know, and that's, they can put whatever they want on display and people are going to go see it. But, but those I smaller nonprofit places, you know, they really, really depend on, their stuff being of interest. Otherwise people aren't going to come. So, you know, you can, that $20 you send in the mail that, you know, that, that does have a much larger impact than you would think. And you addressed it already, but even at the Smithsonian, that real estate, those, I remember when you said 19 buildings, like they're huge, they're still in demand. They've got way more than they've ever got on room on the shelves by the oh, yeah. 100, right? So everything that they put in there is looking at trends and looking at, making sure people are satisfied and that the stuff is there that they want. And if we're silent, they're never going to put guns up there. Mm -hmm. um, I wish when I went there, I would have made more of a pub, not a public stink, but like a, like you're saying, a deliberate comment card or something to say, I barely missed the firearms that we saw here, I think in the eighties or whenever it was, I went there. Do you remember a long, long, long time ago when they had all the guns out? Am I crazy? I don't. I, I, uh, unfortunately I hadn't, uh, my first exposure to the Smithsonian wasn't uh, wasn't until the the early 2000s, so um, it was all already gone by the time I got around to it. And just a side question, maybe: Do you think that if the let's say there was an organization called Let's Take 3D, let's take pictures of everything in the Smithsonian's guns, it, would they be open to an organization that was legit to come in that was funded? To, would they give them, I guess, access? to do what they're trying to do or is it have is it like one of these union things where it has to be done by the their procedures you know that that's a good question i'm i'm not sure um you know a, as with anything uh that is related to the federal government and funded by the federal government um they are they can be a little weird on who they allow access to do different things um so i'm i'm not sure uh, how that would be handled. Um, it's possible they might be open to something like that because, uh, you know, as we had mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, you know, their goal is to get everything digitized and have it on display. Um, but, you know, they've, they've also got really, really remarkable and incredibly expensive photography equipment uh, and incredibly well-paid GS 11, 12, 13 folks taking the photos that they've got to justify them on the payroll as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure because that would definitely be a, a mutually beneficial thing uh, at a place like the Smithsonian. Um, but again, when you're dealing with the government, things get hinky real quick. Sure. And it's not like they just have some procedure where here you fill out this form and do it. They're going to have to have, you know, it would be creating something probably. Yeah, exactly. So um Definitely a lot easier to get in and see it than it would be to to get that kind of access. Yeah. Um, let's go the other way then. Let's talk about if you had to put all of the museums out there that we've experienced as or as far as access. I'm going to say the NRA museum because so many people go to DC anyway uh, that that part of it's pretty simple and there's so much stuff to see in DC. Uh, and that museum, again, free, right? You just park in the back. I, I guess I've been there times when there's a little bit less parking than others, but most of the time you can find a parking space during the week and uh, pretty much walk right in during business hours. One of the best museums on the planet and I don't know, it takes maybe an hour if you're really looking at everything, a couple of hours and you're right back to DC and you could sneak away while somebody else is looking at something boring. Right. Yeah. And, and that was, uh, that was one thing that we encountered, you know, people in town looking at this, that, and the other, uh, I want to get away from it for a little bit. You know, uh, I, I don't want to go into, uh, the botanical gardens or whatever. And, uh, and they happen to have a rental car and they can get out to, to the museum there and switch it up a little bit. And you're right. Yeah. It's, it is a, a nice little break from the hustle and bustle of DC because it's, it is not in the district. It's in Virginia. Um, there is, 
there is no public transit that will get you to it. Uh, you've you've got to have your own rental car because you would pay through the nose with an Uber or something like that. But oh, right, okay. I was gonna say because even what, I don't I, I know people there, so they tell me when to drive when there's no traffic. But right. I mean, I've been there with gridlock. I, 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 luckily, I can avoid that. But it doesn't take too long to get out there. But I guess I'm not thinking Uber. That's probably by the mile or something. Right. Yeah. Uber would uh, would be expensive, uh, an expensive way to go. But but if you have a rental car, you know, definitely, definitely worth the time to get out there and see it. And there's some giant mall across the street. We've eaten sushi there and stuff. So potentially you could get bring people out, go, drop them at that mall, sneak a couple. There you uh, go. Something to the under Amy's. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Now, um, down in D.C., there's all kinds besides the Smithsonian, which we're complaining about, I guess. But um, there's like the FBI Museum, right? And then the, the CIA or something has a neat museum. Have you been to this? Well, a lot of that stuff, they've got neat collections, um, but they're they're not necessarily open to the public. You know, for example, like the FBI reference collection um, and stuff like that. Uh, if if you have a way to get in and, and check it out, um, you know, there's there's really cool stuff. Um, but it's not, it's not run like a, a public access kind of museum, you know, uh, it, it, and it makes sense. I mean, you can't, can't expect to walk into the FBI headquarters and, uh, and, and gain access to oh, but anything have, and everything. Don't they have a museum? I mean, even here in Tucson, the police department has a couple of Dillinger's guns, I think, whenever they crack, got them here. Um, I thought maybe they'd have like some of their crime guns or stuff on display at the, some kind of museum. I'm not sure uh, what they have on display uh, because uh, I, I haven't had a chance to to go in and check that one out yet. It's on my list. I have a I have a connection there. I just haven't had a chance to check it out. Um, another one that I will say though that is really cool in in terms of of talking about three letter organizations um, is the museum that's on display uh, in the CIA headquarters. Um, and of course, that's uh, that is difficult to get into, um, but it is really cool. They've got a remarkable amount of stuff on display there. You know, you'll you'll see stuff like deer guns and well rods, and um, they have an, an AK-47 that was picked up uh, from next to Osama bin Laden after after our guys took him out, um, and, and all sorts of other really impressive stuff in there. Um, but again, it, you know, it, when, when you say it's difficult to get into, are we talking about my two different things? Maybe my sister went to one when she was visiting DC and told me I had to go because they had all like the clandestine spy guns and stuff. Or do you mean like you have to do background checks to get into the museum, or there's maybe a different museum? Well, it's different. So uh, your sister may have gone to the the spy museum. Okay. That's um, which which is its own separate entity that's uh that is uh, a tourist attraction whereas what what i'm talking about is is actually in cia headquarters okay so you don't um, have like a reason to go you don't they just don't have like a tour of that museum like they do with nra right yeah no i you know i had to submit to a background check and give them my social security number and uh all, all sorts of crazy stuff for them to to run checks on weeks in advance before I went out there. Um, whereas opposed to, you know, the, the spy museum, you can, you can just go and check it out, which is cool. Uh, the spy museum's neat. I would definitely recommend going and, and checking that out if you happen to be in the area as well. So that's a cool one. Um, I guess I just wanted to bring up one last thing on this first show, me personally, and then of course bring up anything you want to that we might have missed already. But um, one of my, passions is Bannerman and I you know went out and finally saw the castle uh, which is mm -hmm. pretty cool. I can't wait to try to get out there again as soon as I left I found out that the boat captain follows me on Instagram <laughs> oh wow YouTube so like you know you take a boat to get out to the island and uh, hopefully that means I can I really like to get a 3d camera a 360 camera on a drone That'd be cool. and archive the build you know the castle as it is before it falls down any further because it eventually yeah. down, right but um I'm not aware of anything. I know that some of the stuff has been collected by interested parties, but I'm not aware of it ever being on display anywhere. Do you know of anything like with Bannerman, uh, any kind of museum or partial of a collection that devotes? No, you know, I mean, because Bannerman being what it was being surplus, you know, the, the whole point was, you know, that stuff all got sold. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't know of, of anyone who's managed to amass enough of it. Uh, to kind of create a Bannerman museum, 
Um, but the castle is really cool and it's, it's definitely, definitely worth checking out before, uh, like you said, before it falls anymore into disrepair. Have you had a chance to get up there? Uh, no, I have not. I don't, uh, I don't make it up into new England a whole lot, but I definitely want to go because they do, you know, as you know, they do offer the tours and stuff and, and I, I follow them on Instagram and, and keep track and definitely want to get out there because that like the Browning, uh, home site and everything is kind of a, kind of a gun guy Mecca, you know, I mean, it's so <laughs> much stuff flowed through Bannermans. Uh, in the the 19th and 20th centuries, I mean, you you couldn't shake a stick at anything surplus and it not be Bannerman. <laughs> you literally created surplus, like the concept of collecting and surplus stores. Yes. And started creating, yeah, neat. Uh, now West Point is like right, skip, hop, skip, and jump from there. Is there anything like a museum at West Point? Yeah, there is a museum at West Point, and it is very cool. Um, I was up there a number of years ago uh, for a wedding. Um, the West Point facility itself is very cool. I mean, because it's West Point. Come on, you know. Um, but definitely, definitely worth going. They've got an amazing collection there. Um, lots of really great historic stuff. Um, so yeah, if you happen to be up there, you know, definitely plan to spend some time. Not not just going through the museum, but even just exploring the grounds up there, uh, especially, you know, if you go in the, in the spring or the fall, uh, it's just a, a gorgeous time of year to be there in New York and, and explore and all that stuff. Yeah, that's a great point too. And some of this could probably be coordinated because those, that area in New York where Bannerman is and West Point and stuff, and I'm assuming it's like that in Connecticut and that valley, the Gun Valley, um, yep. which is beautiful when the, when the leaves turn and literally people go up there just to drive. So you could, again, like coordinate some sort of a, you know, stay, a quick vacation to get up and use that as a destination. And then, yeah, exactly. Plan it up there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you could, you could do Bannerman and the Met and the Wadsworth and, uh, and West Point and the Connecticut History Museum and um, the American Precision Museum and, you know, and so on and so forth and just hit everything up there in New England uh, and, and really immerse yourself. So definitely with a little bit of planning. Yeah, you could, you could go see a lot of it up there. Well, I've got to play host and end it. I scheduled uh, Ken Blanchard for directly after this one. So uh, thanks, Logan, for being uh, applicable to that. We'll uh, continue to do these chats on Mondays. And uh, let us know. Give us some feedback. This is a new uh, project, and uh, we're kind of developing it as we go. Uh, anything else, like I said, you wanted to mention that we might have overlooked or um, yeah, just uh, let us know in the comments if there are uh, any specific museums that you would like us to discuss and, and go over uh, between the two of us. We've been to a lot of them um, and we can we can give you some some tips and pointers and um, let us know what interests you. You know, what of this conversation bored you to tears and what of it do you want to hear more about? Because uh, that's that's the whole point of this. We're, we're here to to help extol that information to the rest of you guys, so. Exactly, and instead of just uh, kind of uh, drifting through, we've got a incredible resource here with Logan, and like say, we've been to a lot of these, so if you've got a question on where to park or how much it's gonna cost, you know, we can get in any of those kind of details, because our goal is to, to get you to these museums uh, and to make you aware of them so that when you're doing whatever you might be doing in real life, or maybe you're talking to a friend and they say, hey, I'm going to Oklahoma City, definitely want to let them know about the 45th infantry division museum and the, the cowboy museum uh then there's other things too but uh you know being able to give somebody that heads up just as a nice favor to give another gun guy and somebody's exactly amazing telling somebody about dragon man being able to experience dragon man you'll have a you'll that guy will owe you a favor forever that guy or gal will owe you a favor forever Exactly. Yeah. You know, or you get a guy who's a World War II buff, you know, tell him you can go to Springfield and, and check out, you know, Garand serial number one. I mean, that's doesn't get any better than that for someone who's into World War II stuff. There's. All right. Well, everybody for uh, watching us live. We'll be back next Monday. Thanks so much. Have a good night, guys. Oh, I'm in the wrong button. There we go. <laughs> you should probably get